what a joy it is to join you this day in Mombasa. Hallelujah. And uh, I'm humbled uh, just to have this opportunity to fellowship with you in the spirit. Amen. And one with another. Hallelujah. Um, I love you. I love you. I love you. And I think I'm done with my message. Amen. Yeah, I bring you greetings from Church in Nairobi, Dominion Assembly, where I trust and fellowship. Amen. Amen. They sent us with your with their love. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Um, and uh, you know, when we came here Wednesday with my family, basically we were coming for a vacation. We were not coming for ministry. And I was we were coming just to have some good time with my covenant brother. Hallelujah. Amen. And for those who don't know you, Pastor George also has been my pastor. Wow. I have sat under him and served. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And uh, we're just having our good time. And, uh, you know, of course, when Pastor George, you know, put me in the program to share and minister today, I asked her the Holy Ghost, all right, so what do I tell the people of Mombasa? Because you have it all. You've had it, you've received it. And as I was pondering in my spirit, of course, many times the Holy Ghost would give me a word and I could ponder over it and sleep over it, pray through it. And uh, the most amazing thing, he took me back to a word that I was sharing last Sunday back in Nairobi. So my wife would be privileged to hear it for the second time. And I kept having the Holy Ghost, asking the Holy Ghost, do I have to go through it again? He said, yes, that's the word. I said, okay. And so, in obedience to the Lord, I will just flow as the Holy Spirit will lead and direct me. Amen. But above all things, I want to encourage you to open up your spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I've actually been laboring on how to deliver it. Hallelujah. Amen. But let me tell you, the Lord loves you people so much. Because I find myself that any time I'm here and I happen to uh, minister or share the word, the Lord gives me a special grace. And I find myself doing things that I normally don't do. Amen? Amen. So if you find me acting strangely, it is just the grace of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But a few people who stood here to give testimony have said something that if you are keen to listen, uh, did you hear somebody say that you are in the right place? Uh, being here is great. Did you hear somebody say that? Yeah. And in light of that, I want just to talk about a word the Lord gave me from the beginning of the year. And it is about divine positioning. Amen. Being divinely positioned by God. Amen. Amen. I will pick a number of scriptures from the book of Genesis and a few others in scriptures as the Holy Ghost will direct and lead us. But I want to say this. I want you to note in scripture you will find a pattern of how God many times whenever he wanted to interact with man or communicate to man he always chose 
a designated place. He always happened to have a venue of his own choice. When he wanted to meet with the children um, 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 of Israel, or rather Moses, he called him up to the mountain. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When he wanted Abraham to offer up Isaac, he instructed him to leave and go to a place that they will show him. And the mountain, or rather the hill that Abraham went up with Isaac to offer him was a mountain or a hill that God chose. Somebody with me? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 We see in the New Testament when Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. He was precise and specific. He told them, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. He was specific to where they were to wait. Hallelujah. And there are many encounters in scripture. Moses, the Bible tells us in Genesis 3, in Exodus 3, we find an account when he was standing his father's father's law uh, sheep. The Bible says that you know, a shepherd, if, if you just imagine a shepherd's day-to-day um, 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 activity whenever he's out taking care of his flock, he will always dust where he'll think or consider there is pasture. That is where he'll take the sheep, right? And it is on this one particular occasion that Moses happens to go next to the Mount Horeb. And that was an area that he frequented most times. And scripture gives an account and he said he decided to take the sheep to the other side of the mountain. And the moment he appeared on the other side of the mountain, something happened. I hear you. Thank you, Jesus. That mount was considered the mount of God. Yes. Hallelujah. In other words, God's presence. And so when he went to the other side, that is the place he had in the encounter of the burning bush. The Bible records that suddenly before him, there was a sight that was, you know, so outstanding. He could see a bush burning, but it was not being consumed. And he told himself, I will turn aside to go and see what is this sight. And as he approached closer to it, the Lord spoke to him and he said, Moses, don't come nigh. Yes. Right? The place you are about to step into is holy ground. Amen. So the Lord told him, get your sandals off. Amen. Amen. When God gave Moses the instructions, even to build the tabernacle, he was specific, not only in terms of the plan and the structure, but where it was going to be built. Amen? Amen. And so there are several, several accounts of this. That any time God wanted to have an interaction with man, he chose the venue. Hear me. You can never dictate where God is going to show up. It is he who chooses where and when to show up. Hallelujah. And because since he he is God and is the one who makes the choice and the decision, how much more is required of you and I to seek to know where does he want me to be? Because where he wants to be to be, it is exactly where he will choose to show up. Being in the very place that God wants you to be, Being in that venue that God has designated for himself is literally what I call divinely positioning yourself. Hallelujah. And so I just want to give you an account in the book of Genesis. Amen? Amen. So tell your neighbor, neighbor. Shut down your intellect frequency. (laughs) 
and open up your Holy Ghost frequency. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you're not if you're not tuned well, you miss it. Amen. Amen. All right. So fasten up your seatbelts and we're going to go. Amen. Amen. In Genesis one, and I just pick a number of sample scriptures in Genesis one, two, and three. Amen. Amen. But I just want to um, um, give us a background of. Um, something that we clearly know in Genesis 1 we find an account and uh, the Bible describes to us about the beginning of creation and how God came to a point where he made a decision to uh, make man and that is in chapter 1 verse 26 and scripture says and God said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God says, let us make man to be like us. But we are going to give him a realm where he will be able to operate from. I will give him a place where he's going to carry out his duty and assignment. Yes. The Bible tells us that the heavens and the highest heavens belong to God, but the earth he has given to man, or rather the sons of men. Hallelujah. So he does make man to be like him and gives him dominion, it gives him authority. And verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, God created him. Male and female created he them. And verse 28 says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fall of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Hallelujah. So God makes man having the very essence of himself. But he gives him a realm called earth. That which he has created. And he says, the other that I've created, I need myself to rule and dominion over. I need somebody to carry out my purposes on the other that I've created. So he puts man there, and the Bible says, gives him dominion. Listen, three realms. He talks about the birds of the air. And he talks about the beasts of the field. And he talks about the fish in the sea. Which means the atmosphere, the earth. And under the earth, man is given authority to rule and have dominion Amen. executing God's will and desire on earth Amen. so all that God creates man literally knows my job is to carry on what he has made me for Amen. and he tells him subdue replenish in other words it means that which is of me, I, God, your creator, let it spread forth on the earth. Amen. Let it spread forth on the air and under the sea. Amen. Have dominion, subdue. The word subdue also means bring into order that which is not in order. Amen. And sure nothing goes out of order. Amen. That is what subdue means. And sure everything is aligned to my will and my purpose and my desire. Amen. Amen. Then the scripture goes further in chapter 2. Go with me to chapter 2 of Genesis. Verse 7. If you are there, give me a big amen. Amen. 
Verse 7 of chapter 2 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. I want you to understand in this account, the Bible now speaks about the bodily form. Chapter 1 talks about man the spirit. Chapter 2 brings to us the form, this flesh, that God forms it and breathes into it his spirit and man becomes a living soul. Hallelujah. So, chapter 1, man the spirit already has dominion and authority. Alright? Amen? Amen? But listen, the earth that God created was physical. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And so, for what God needed to be executed on earth, He needed a physical being. So He forms man and gives man body that he can walk, talk. Bless the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And then the scripture says in verse 8, and the Lord God planted a garden. Who did what? God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Now, the word eastward in Eden tells us something. He chose the site. Eastward of Eden, exactly where he wants his garden to be. And the Bible says, and there he put the man whom he had formed. There he put the man whom he had formed. Now, Adam did not find his well to the garden. Adam was put into the garden by God himself. And verse 9 tells us, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pishon. That is what, that is um, which compasses the whole land of Havila where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedlam and the oil stone. And the name of the second river, Gihon, the same it is with uh, that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river, Hidekel, that is it which goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Then verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. At this point in time, God takes man and positions him in the garden that he himself has planted. Amen. Chose the site, planted the garden, took man who he has created in his own image, he has given him authority, mandate, dominion to execute his will and purposes on earth, and then takes him and puts him in the very garden that he has planted and tells man, take care of it and keep it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. At this point, you would note that God did not give him a manual how to take care of the garden. He just told him, take care of it and keep it. In other words, it tells us God was telling Adam, you already know what you need to do. So take good care of it and keep it. Amen? Amen. Then I want to show you what kind of activity took place. Just one among the very many. Okay. Go with me to verse 19. Verse 19 tells us, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he who called them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name 
thereof. Wow. God goes further, the man that he has created his likeness and image, after he has created all the creatures, the birds and everything, he brings them to his associate partner and tells him, Adam, what are we going to call this? Listen, every living creature, God did not name it. Man did. Hallelujah. Amen. It is man who came up with the name Fisi. Bubwa. Kondo. Not God. God designated man to name. Now, think about the dimension and the level of partnership at this point. You cannot designate anybody to do something for you if you haven't brought them to a dimension that you can entrust them. Are you seeing that? Think of how much God held Adam so dear to him that he could involve him in his project creation. He said, Adam, I have finished creating all these creatures. Now this is the naming ceremony. Please, it's your time. So Adam goes to the elephant and he looks at God and says, elephant. And God says, yes. And on and on and on and on. The Bible clearly tells us that whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Meaning God acknowledged and said yes. Verse 20 says, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an helpmate for him. So at this level you can see the flow of that relationship and how they can work together in partnership. The level of trust. How God involved man in the whole process and to what he created. How he entrusted him to a point that even the garden that he planted and chose, he takes man and says, all right, please take care of it. The partnership, the trust, the relationship. Amen? Then go with me now to chapter number three. Of course, this is where we find the account of the fall. But this is where now we will also draw from ourselves the heart of the core of the message. Chapter 3. We know the account of what took place and how they were deceived to eat of the fruit. Alright? But I will not go into there. Chapter 3, verse 8. Okay? Verse 8. The Bible declares, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God, among us the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 8, I read again. 
And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Prior to the fall of Adam, God was a frequent guest in the garden. Same God who entrusted him to give names to the animals that he created, all the creatures. He was a frequent guest. They used to have moments together in the garden. There was a level of fellowship, relationship. There was a time of intimacy and sharing. Alright? But I want to draw to you this pictorial image for you to see it better. The Bible tells us God is spirit, right? Yes. Right? Yes. But in verse 8, it tells us, it tell us that they had the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. Now, how does spirit walk? In the physical, you can hear footsteps of somebody. Amen? Hallelujah. If my dear wife, she's walking, I know her footsteps. And I say, oh, that's what I'm coming. But for Adam, how did it happen that they could hear the Lord walking and God is spirit? It was in the cool of the day. Was it that in the garden he could hear, you know, you know when you step on, on, on dry leaves, you know how they sound. You can easily tell something is coming. How is it that they could hear? And how was God walking? But it tells you, at this point, Adam was acquainted, amen, to the ways of God. He knew him. Out of those moments that they could fellowship together, because God was a frequent visitor from the very beginning, from the moment he put him in the garden, I told totally him take care of it. To the point where he gave, brought all the living creatures and told Adam, give them names and he named each one of them. God was a frequent guest and a partner with Adam in the garden. But there is this one day that God shows up in the garden. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And when he shows up, listen to this. God having known what transpired prior to that. Because you see, by the time they were being deceived, by the time they were eating the fruit, was God not seeing? Was God not knowing? But when he shows up and the garden, Adam and Eve, out of their own accord, choose to hide from the presence of God. At this point, I want to draw your attention and realize this. That since creation, God has always been coming to man. It's not man going to God. He's always coming. Through scripture, look to the accounts. God always came to man. Whether it be through angels, whether it be through prophets, whether through supernatural encounters and experiences, God kept coming to man. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Jesus came to man. Hallelujah. And so God comes to the very place, the garden that he planted, he designated and took man whom he created and positioned him in the garden. He always frequented the garden because that was his designated venue of appointment, of fellowship, of communion. 
any time he needed to have moments with man, he always came to the garden. And so on this particular day, he comes and he finds Adam already hiding, trying to keep up from his presence. And then this is what happens. The scripture tells us, God called out to Adam, having known what they have done, the first question he asked, where are you? He didn't begin by asking, what have you done? It is, where are you? I left you here. We were with you just the other day. I have come back. Where are you? Now, scripture tells us that they were hiding. <laughs> All right? <laughs> you see, God is omnipresent. How do you hide from him? He sees. And where they were trying to hide. Hallelujah. Of course, it was among leaves. All right? Some bush or something. Amen? Hallelujah. Pastor just talked about bush ministry. I don't want to go there. <laughs> and you think about it. They are trying to hide from His presence. Yet God can see them exactly where they are. He does not tell them, I can see you. He asks, where are you? What happened at this point in time? All through the relationship between Adam and God was always in the spirit. Because you cannot commune with God in the flesh. He is spirit. Hallelujah. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, that a time is coming and now has come when true worshippers will worship God in truth and in spirit. Because God is spirit. And God is seeking for such. Hallelujah. You don't interact with God in the flesh. You don't interact with God using your intellectual mind and understanding. Our interactions with God is always in the spirit. Faith Faith, let me tell you, faith resides in the realm of the spirit. Because mm. you cannot touch it. You cannot feel it. Yes. But the Bible says, but now faith is. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. So, the association and relationship, man and God was always in the spirit. And this time, God is spirit. And the Bible says, Adam could hear God's voice. He could hear him walking. He could sense, yes, the Lord is showing up. But this time, Adam, having known what he has done, chooses to hide. And God shows up. He is spirit and asks Adam, where are you? Not meaning that I cannot see you. He could see him. The bottom line is this. He could try and reach him out in the realm of the spirit. He could not find him. Adam, we've always been having some Holy Ghost time. Where are you? I positioned you not only in the garden, physical, but in, in, in me, in the spirit, in a place that I can always access you. But where are you now? I can't find you where I placed you. I cannot find you where I positioned you. The venue where we always meet you and then. You. You're not in our meeting venue. So where are you, Adam? Where are you? And listen to what Adam says. Listen to what Adam says. Verse 10. The Bible says, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Then God goes to the next question. Who told you? He hasn't come to the point, what have you done? Yes, who told you? Because as far as God was concerned, the place of meeting 
and the person he meets with was so essential more than anything else. Not finding Adam where God positioned him mattered a lot. Adam, I can't find you. Not that he cannot see him. He could see him. But at that point, Adam, you see, when we talk about the fall of man, it is not just because of the sin of disobedience, but the fall of man carries with it that man, God intended him to walk with him in the spirit, fellowship with God in the spirit, dwell with God in the spirit, relate with God in the spirit, communion with God in the spirit. But you see, when man disobeyed, he fell. He came out from man's spirit and came to the reality of man, the flesh. They were naked all through this time. Even the moments God would come, listen, by the time God was giving Adam the assignment to name the elephant and the donkey and the whatever, whatever, he was naked. When he brought Eve to him, the woman, and Adam saw, and he said, Wow, bone of my bone, flesh of my veins, and said, And called her, you shall be a woman. She was naked. And all this time, they were, Adam never saw Eve in a nakedness and says, Wow. <laughs> what is this? What is that? No. They enjoyed one another in the Holy Ghost. Amen. There was no shame. Amen. There was no embarrassment. Amen. There was no guilt feeling Amen. or shy. Adam, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> no. But when they slightly came from the divine position in the spirit, their eyes were open to the things that they were not meant to focus on. Amen. And all of a sudden, oh, shame comes in, embarrassment comes in. And a God who's so holy, who enjoyed man's fellowship and communion, shows up and can't find Adam. Adam, where are you? I can't get you. Where are you? And listen to me. Many times, all the time, it is not God who fails to show up. It is us, whenever He shows up, we are not available. You can be in a place where you're trusting and believing God for something, and you're praying and believed and stretched your faith and said, Lord, come through for me. Yes, he answers prayers. Yes. Jeremiah 33, he says, verse 3 says, Call unto me. And what will I do? What will I do? I will show you. I will show you. Which means God is always more than ready to answer whenever we call. But after we have called and believed, instead of positioning us ourselves in the place of communion and intimacy with God, patiently waiting, do you know what happens? We move away from that venue by beginning to complain and murmur. God, now what is this? Lord, how long? Ah, mini me choker. God, if you are there, why did this? Why did that? Why did that? And the moment he shows up, the recipient is not available. Where does God find you each time he shows up? Does he always find you in the designated place he had appointed to meet with you? Or are you long gone? And most times, believers, there's always, you know, we get to a place where time goes, years goes, and it's like, God, uh -uh. I think this was not meant for me. Uh -uh. He's always ready to come through for you. But whenever he shows up, he doesn't find you where he had designated for you to be. See what happened to Adam and Eve. After they are falling, 
Adam, instead of beginning to repent, begins to point out a figure and says, it is the woman. And the woman goes further to say, it is the serpent. Do you know what that ends up in? It ends up to a point that says, okay, these guys are not even repentant. It says, then you are not even worthy still being in the garden where I've chosen to be. You don't deserve to be in the divine position where I've ordained you to be. They are chased out of it. Where are you in the place of faith? Where are you in the place of trusting God? Where are you in the place of waiting on Him? Where are you in the place of patience? Where are you in the place of walking with God? Because many other times, brethren, we always get out of the venue. Let me fast track and bring you to the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. Amen. In chapter 2 of Acts. I was made to understand you've been going through the book of Acts. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Chapter 2 of book of Acts. Let me point out to you one or two things quickly. Verse 1. And two. Are you there? Yes. Are you there? Yes. Okay. I want you to go with me. All right. How does it begin, verse one? What does it say? Read your Bible aloud. What does it say? And when the day of Pentecost came, Amen. That means there's always going to be that time that will come. A moment that will come. An hour that will come. Alright? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, what happened? The disciples were all together in one place. That is the upper room. The venue Jesus chose. Now, if you read scripture carefully, you will find... The upper room where they were, it is the same room that they had the Last Supper. And that room, it is the very place that Jesus had instructed two of his disciples and told them, go to Jerusalem. As you approach it, you will find a man carrying, you know, uh, 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 a what? A pitcher. Now, it is not... A Jewish tradition to find a man carrying a picture that was carried by women. So you'll find a man carrying a picture. This is follow him, and into the house he gets into getting there, and then ask for the master. All right. So he directed them to the very place and the venue where they should prepare for the last supper. It is the same place that they went and gathered together to wait for the promise of the Father. And the Bible says they were all gathered together in one place. Uh huh. All right. And in one accord. Are we together? Then what happened? Verse 2 says what? Suddenly. Hold on. Suddenly there was what? A sound as of a mighty rushing wind. Now, listen to this. Think for a moment. While they were in that place, they were about there for about an estimated 10 days. Alright? Almost two weeks. There. The Bible records the women were there. Amen? Mary, they were there. Are you getting me? Now, <laughs> if I take you back a bit, it's this. These guys are guarded on the Mount of Olives, the very place where, you know, where Jesus you know, was, was taken up before their eyes. And like any other day, the way some of you have come here, and you know, after service, I'm going to go home. Uh, if you're in Nairobi, we normally buy maize when it is hot. So that's a panic of a chance that with your home, which was in the mind, in the lake, and the sea, 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 
So most of the women who are gathered there, they knew at the end of it, they will go back to their homes and carry on with their daily chores, right? But the instructions, the Bible says they were commanded to go and wait. So they all gathered together in the upper room. The disciples and the women, they were all there. Ten days. So, Ule alikuwa meacha maindi yake inje ikauke. I don't know what happened. Hallelujah. Amen. Those who may have washed their clothes, wakacha inje ya niki ya kauke. Whatever happened, you can imagine. Ten days they were there waiting. Now, think for a moment on this particular day of the Pentecost. If the disciples, all the women, all whoever would have said, by the way, Wacha nikimbia home kidogo. Uh, Nikatuwe zile maindi. Alafu niruti. And that moment they decided to go and give themselves to bully. <laughs> it is the very hour the promise comes. What would have happened if they were not there? How many times, brethren, when the Lord is about to reach out to us, He finds us missing. Ukomtet. Hallelujah. And, and you know, being tethered does not necessarily mean not physically present. You can have wandered away in a heart of grumbling, complaining, murmuring, anger, bitterness. These things can take you away from His presence. Let me read you this scripture. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. One of the Beatitudes. I love this Beatitude. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. Listen to this Beatitude. Read with me aloud. What does it say? Blessed are the pure in heart. Uh huh. For they shall prosper. For they will conquer kingdoms. For they shall be given lands. What's going to happen? They shall see God. That means not the day when you go to heaven. You can experience God on a day-to-day -day experience. Yes, see Him. Yes, but it demands for a purity of heart. Wow. A purity of heart. What does it mean? A pure heart means a heart. Right? That is... How can I put it this way? We normally drink pure clean water, right? Mm. Alright? Pure clean water simply means its absence of impurity. So a pure heart means it's the absence of anything that is impure. A heart that has no nothing to contaminate. Other translations, other words that the scripture uses, you know, when the Bible says a sincere heart, it talks about a pure heart. Amen. Amen. When the Bible speaks about truthfulness, that God desires truth in the inward parts, it talks about the state of the heart. It is the purity of the heart. A heart that has no, no impurity, no spot, no blemish, no nothing. Such a heart will always see God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. A heart that sees God is a heart that will always appreciate. Yes, Bless the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. When I see my beautiful white hair, I say, wow, I can see the glory of the Lord. <laughs> I'm looking at the beauty, but I can see God's glory. Amen. That's a pure heart. You see God in every sphere of life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You don't take little things for granted. That's a pure heart. Yeah. The Bible says, blessed, but they will see God. And you see, saints, if you remain in our divine position in the spirit, first and foremost, hallelujah, Amen. there will always be an opportunity to see God. 
whatever it is, you will always see him. You will always see him. For Adam, he could hear. But this time, he could not afford to see. Why? Something went wrong. He knew I have locked it. Uh -uh. I can't stand it. Hallelujah. And that's why God says, Where are you, Adam? I can't see you. Where are you? Because I cannot find you in the place of purity. I cannot find you in the place of truth. I cannot find you in the place of holiness. Where are you? Bless the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, as I bring this to a close, brethren, it's a moment for us to understand that in the time and the season we have, God has brought us into, we have to be divinely positioned. Amen. You need to know where the Lord wants you to be every moment. Listen, this is another time. Paul puts it this way. We got to be wise. Amen? Amen. Let me read for you the scripture in the book of Ephesians. I want to echo the words of Paul in the book of Ephesians. Verse 15. He says, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fool, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. This means, brethren, we need to know how we walk. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You know... <laughs> I was telling the brethren last Sunday church, this is not a time, this is not a season where have you found yourself in a situation where you are in the house, you don't know what to do, then you walk out of the house, then you exactly don't know where you're going and you begin to think of Sunday and the happy. <laughs> you're beginning to look of where This are not the times to walk like that. Hallelujah. Amen. When you are in tune with the Lord, you will find yourself in the place where God wants you to be. Amen. At the moment He wants you to be. Bless the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 The testimony that we had at the beginning of the service, let me tell you, these brethren are not experiencing because a prophetic word came forth. Hallelujah. A prophetic word can come forth, but you can miss it. You can miss it. But when you understand the importance of seeking to know where God wants you to be at any given moment, that's walking wisely. Because when He shows up, He will definitely show up. You will experience Him. Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to close by saying this. This ministry being in Mombasa at this moment in time. I've not, I've, I've, Pastor George is listening to this for the first time. It is divinely ordained by God. Hallelujah. I remember about. 11, 12 years, 2007, 6, 2006, the Lord began to tell me about Mombasa. Amen. And of course, over the years, a lot of things happened, and Pastor George came to Mombasa, and I began to hear what's going on and what's happening in my spirit. I knew God is divinely positioning us. Amen. Amen for what he has ordained and purpose to do in Mombasa. Bless the name of Jesus. Amen. So for you even to be here is divinely ordained by God. 
But even as God positions you in this garden called Ray of Light, bless the name of Jesus, don't be found missing when God shows up and asks, where are you? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. There is so much God has in store for us, for his people. But listen, you have to keep yourself in line and in tune moment by moment. Bless the name of Jesus. Divinely position yourself in the spirit. Divinely position yourself in prayer. Divinely position yourself in word. Divinely position yourself in fellowship. Divinely position yourself that when the hour cometh, there's going to be a sudden experience. Hallelujah. Because that's what's going to happen. When God shows up, He definitely shows up. Bless the name of Jesus. But may He not find you unavailable. Hallelujah. Mteja aliekua wakiroho hapatikani wa sasa. And you know, I've had many people say, you know, me I do not know. Speak a man in Mount Biangu. Divinely position yourself. Hallelujah. Because he can never miss to show up. He can never miss to reveal. He can never miss to direct. He can never miss to instruct. He can never miss to guide. Hallelujah. He can never miss to speak. Amen. I'm amazed at how sometimes God speaks to me. Very interesting ways. Hallelujah. You know, there are moments my wife will look at me and say, Where is my? In those are moments I'm downloading something in the Holy Ghost. She says, I'm, I'm, I'm. She says, That's mine. What's going on in your mind? Well, let me tell you. Is a daily and an exciting walk. Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's rise on our feet.